Uh, all right, so let's start uh, with National Monetization Plan. I'm the first speaker. After me, Nilesh uh, and Nisha would uh, respectively speak. Uh, so let me start uh, with this. So uh, recently we've heard, uh, you know, Union Finance Minister, as well as in various uh, newspapers or uh, digital media, everywhere we've, we've seen this term National Monetization Plan, as mentioned uh, by this, uh, you know, by Zibi Mouth. So uh, I'll, I'll let me just present the, you know, my perspective as well as a little bit of introduction about what it is and what it is concerned about. Why you know government has brought this and what whether it is going to benefit uh, or whatever it is going to do. Let's see the outcome. All right. So uh, the Nirmala Sitharaman, the Union Finance Minister, unveiled in detail uh, Centre's four-year infrastructure asset monetization program. Uh, it amounts to uh, around 6 trillion rupees or 6 lakh crore rupees. Or when we convert it to dollar terms, it, uh, US dollars, it is around $82 billion. Uh, it is worth uh, this much amount of money. Okay. And so before, before I present uh, this in detail, uh, I would like to bring the aspect of the budget, you know, annual financial statement as it is called. Uh, according to the Indian Constitution, Article 112. So, uh, you know, uh, when we look at the budget figures uh, this year presented by the government, uh, by finance. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, when we look at the budget figures, not just of this year, but also recent years, we could see that there is a huge shortfall in government revenues uh, vis a vis total expenditures of the government. So, we do need to get money in order to spend it on you know important uh, important sections of the economy such as infrastructure uh, as well as taking care of vulnerable sections of the people uh, so we do need you know a lot of money and now we can't take everything as debt because it costs money you have to pay interest payments uh, you know you also increase your debt when you're taking uh, the you know if you're borrowing from uh, be it from uh, the domestic investors or the market or or from international market uh, you know it increases our debt uh, anyways moving to the next slide why do we need innovative financing mechanisms such as uh, nmp and national monetization pipeline well tax to gdp ratio and subsidy spending may be the answer so india's tax to gdp ratio as we as we can see in the numbers given it's 2016 data it shows that india's tax to gdp ratio was 16.7 percent well below china's around 20% and USA is 25.4%. Now that Biden government has come, they have increased corporate taxes. So it would be much higher, like it could be somewhere around 28, 29%. Uh, I mean, not just comparing with these two countries, we have France, Denmark, their tax to GDP ratio is abnormally high. We don't have to reach their level, given that you know they have less number of population to take care of still, uh, you know, our, our tax to GDP ratio, as you can see in the slide, it actually hovers around the data or the tax to GDP ratio of Ghana and Tanzania. Of course, we are not aiming to be uh, the world, you know, one of one of the world's largest economy following their tax to GDP ratio. Uh, although introduction of GST and other tax reforms after 2016 have slightly increased this ratio, uh, however, we are yet far behind uh, the competitor countries. Another very interesting information about public finances in India is that last year, uh, the central government, of course, because it was COVID, uh, it spent more than 6 lakh crore in subsidy for the vulnerable section of the population. In the previous year, it was also around 4 to 5 lakh crore rupees, which is, you know, around uh, more than uh, around 25 percent of the public, fine, I mean, total budget of the government in 2019. It could be a little less than that, around 20 percent this year. Uh, anyways, moving to the next slide. So what happened was the government constituted uh, an expert committee uh, and the expert committee uh, on, you know, they recommended that for the next five years in order to uh, create jobs, to build a massive infrastructure, uh, it is important that, you know, they made a plan which, uh, which is called National Infrastructure Pipeline Plan. Uh, it amounts to around a total investment of 111 lakh crore in infra projects over next five years. And following the recommendations of the committee, the expert committee, the finance minister in 2019-20 budget announced an outlay of 100 lakh crore rupee for infrastructure projects over the next five years. 
and nip is a first of its kind in the country it has you know this amount which amounts to around one and a half trillion dollar rupees uh we could actually uh compare this number the amount to five times the economy of pakistan and this is just one component of our spending you know which is infrastructure so nip is a first of its kind historic initiative to provide world class infrastructure across the country and improve the quality of life for all the citizens in the country uh, now the nip is aiming to improve project preparation attracting investments not just domestic but also pension funds such as Ca canada pension funds such as funds from ua you know these these uh, pension funds are long term investors so they they are looking for such uh, such ready to invest projects uh, and uh, this plan nip is actually going to provide this uh, you know th this opportunity to all the investors uh, and help india become a 5 trillion dollar economy as stated by the current government's mandate and as well as the, in their manifesto moving to the next slide what is national monetization plan given this is our topic so national monetization plan involves leasing out so you know nip as we met, as as we saw in the last slide uh, nip is worth 111 lakh crore you know so NI, uh, national uh, infrastructure pipeline now national monetization plan is just a small fraction of the required financial resources that we are going to arrange this way. So around 83% of the total 111 lakh crore is going to come from traditional sources, you know, international financiers, budget, budget, budget spending of the government, as well as various other resources. But, you know, NI, NMP or National Monetization Plan is one of the component, uh, which is said to be an, one of the innovative mechanism of financing uh, for NIP. So NIP involves leasing out around uh, se uh, 7 lakh crore worth, so central government assets valued at around 6 lakh crore over a four year period, ending in 2024 25. It represents an alternative to an outright sale of assets, given that when governments, you know, they, they sell an asset, uh, they lose uh, not just current revenues, say next 10 or 15 years, but they also lose the right to a majority of the period, say 100 years from now. Uh, which uh, which which may not be very ideal for a country like ours where there is so much of population so the major idea behind nmp is to lease out brownfield projects projects to those that are already in existence and proceeds coming from which can be used to finance greenfield projects newer projects the ownership of the assets monetized will remain with the government as we uh, as we mentioned already uh, with the private players will be the operational risk you know they'll have to take care of the revenue coming and uh, whether it is efficient, productive, all these things, government won't have to worry about, right? Moving to the next slide. Unleashing the power of multiplier effect. Now, multiplier effect is an economic concept which refers that uh, a, you know, a certain sum of money, injection of money into the economy can stimulate economic activity in excess of the initial investment. So for example, if government is say investing, uh, injecting 10,000 crore, we may, it depends upon uh, how much uh, the return is, but it could you know, generate uh, an additional uh, economic activity amounting to 50,000 crore, which is five times. So we would say the multiplier effect is five times. So for example, a national highway stretch, uh, you know, which is earning around 500 crore in toll taxes, annually could be leased out to a private investor for 10,000 crore for 10 years. Now, government could use this amount for many greenfield projects, investing anything between 10% to 40% of the project cost, thereby also bringing private investment, creating jobs and building much needed long-term capital assets in the country. You know, uh, for example, like if government gets 10,000 crore rupees upfront, they would have at least 10 different projects where they could invest because not, you know, not, not, uh, it isn't that government has to immediately give all, the entire money to the builder or to to the person you know to the company which is building the the project. They they just have to give certain portion, and likewise they can actually in within two or three years use that ten thousand crore rupees to to you know generate economic activities uh, amounting to much more you know around fifty thousand crore. It depends, as I said, on the number uh, multiplier effect. Uh, coming to the next slide, so rational behind asset monetization. So financing the infrastructure creation, as we uh, already saw above, uh, with a massive infrastructure deficit that our country faces, given that our country is a developing country, finding resources to build physical assets is a huge, you know, it's, it's a difficult task. 
Hence, government wants to monetize existing infrastructure assets by leasing them out to private firms for a fixed tenure under a revenue sharing model. Uh, it is also going to ease fiscal burden given that COVID times, uh, the government revenues have drastically gone down. Uh, the authorities would find it, you know, using asset monetization schemes as some sort of breathing measure, you know, it could actually help the government free up balance sheets and provide more investment into the greenfield infrastructure projects. Uh, it could also provide the states, you know, they have even even, even more battered finances, uh, given that they, you know, they don't have the, uh, the liberty to use RBI and other, uh, or, uh, you know, raise, uh, raise, um, raise uh, borrowing in international markets. So states' finances are even worse. So uh, using uh, this scheme would actually help the state governments as well to, to you know, continue with the public investment uh, uh, during the time of stressed public finances. Now, uh, I'd like to ask my colleague Nilesh to present from here on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Giridhar. Let me share my screen. Is my screen visible to all? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, Nivesh. Visible. visible, right? Yes. yes so uh, I will, uh, my presentation is involving the outlay for the period of 2022 to 2025 when the assets will be monetized. So uh, this provides a breakup, a sector wise breakup of the total assets that the Indian government has. The various assets that are up for monetization are into divided into 13 segments or so 13 sectors, which are roads, telecom, railways, warehousing, power transmission, mining, power generation, aviation, and others. The total value that is to be realized within the period of four years, that is from 2022 to 2025, is around 6 lakh crore rupees. As we can see from the data, and we will see from the slides to come, that roads and railways are the maximum contributors to this NNP program, right? Moving on, the top three sectors that shall contribute are roads, railways, and power sector. Power sector, which includes power generation and power transmission. They will together contribute around 15% of the total value. This shall be done in a phase-wise manner. For example, in this current financial year, 15% of the total assets, which has a value of around 88,000 crores, will be rolled out. Now, as we can see, this is a percentage by share of each sector's contribution to the national monetization program. Roads and railways together contribute more than 50%, while the power sector contributes around 15%. Coming to the phase-wise implementation, We'll start with the roads category. Uh, the National Highway Authority of India has a total net worth of 1,22,000 kilometers of roads under it, which is excluding the network operated by the private sector. Also, the NHI further adds a minimum of two to 3,000 kilometers of road every year. All these facts I am stating to clarify the doubt. There have been doubts that by monetizing these assets, Indian government is selling off these assets to the private sector. Indian government is losing its stake in these sectors. This is These facts and figures show that even if Indian government is monetizing the assets, it is doing so only for a fraction percentage. The major ownership for always lie with the government. For example, in this case, out of more than 1,20,000 kilometers, only 26,000 kilometers have been put up for monetization, which shall contribute an estimated 27%, right? This is around 20% of the base asset of ownership of the roads. This figure shows us a phase-wise planning of how in each and every year, the amount of roads that shall be leased out and the amount of revenue earned. For example, we can see in the current financial year 2021 to 2022, the amount of roads that will be monetized is 5,000 kilometers and it shall give us a revenue of 30,000 crore rupees. Similar figures have been projected for the next three years as well, leading up to 2025. Following that, the railways is expected to contribute around 26% in the NNP, which approximately has a value of more than one and a half lakh crore rupees. This slide shows us the total number of assets that the railway has and the percentage that the railway is supposed to put up for monetization. Hello? Am I audible? 
As we can see from the chart, around 400 railway stations out of more than 7,300 railway stations are to be monetized, which is only 5.5 percent of the total number of stations owned. Similarly, out of close to 13,000 state trains, only 90 trains shall be monetized. Right, close to 2 percent of the existing network of railway tracks, a route of 1,400 kilometers out of 67,000 kilometers, will be monetized. and the list goes on so on and so forth all in all this goes on to show that the government is only monetizing a fraction of the total assets now this chart shows us the phase wise implementation of how various assets will be put up or rolled out for monetization for example the current financial year will see around 40 railway stations two hill railways and three railway stations being monetized similarly for the financial year 2022 to 2023 we have around 120 stations 30 trains that 1400 track kilometers and others being monetized this next slide tells us about the total value of the amount revenue generated in a year wise manner with the total amount being generated to 1 and 1/2 lakh crore rupees there are various similar plans for implementation in other sectors but that would take a lot of time so this is just a brief overview now i'd like to invite nisha to take over and tell us about the instances where this has been done worldwide thank you nilesh um so let me share my screen is everyone uh, my screen is visible to everyone yes yes yes, yes. okay so my topic is instances of where asset monetization within india and outside india has occurred so the first question arises is asset monetization new to india so the question so the answer to this question is no we have already used asset monetization in india in the year 2016 ministry of road transport and highway introduced the toll operate transfer concession framework india for implementing monetization of road assets the tot is a variant of the omt model recently adopted in road sector where consideration paid to the authority is in the form of a front premium this is one of the key model of monetization successfully employed in the road sector in india both by central and the state till date five rounds of tot has been undertaken which you can see in this on the screen and a stretch of 2395 kilometers out of which round out of which three round has been completed the bundle 3 the bundle 1 the bundle 3 and the bundle 5 na ai has raised approximately 17000 crore across these three rounds of tot entailing total round asset of approximately 1400 kilometers again in june 2020 maharashtra state road development corporation awarded the tolling right of mumbai pune express and old mumbai pune corridor to irb infrastructure developer for a total consideration of rupees 8662 crore comprising upfront payment of rupees 6500 crores now the next example is about the airport authority of india the airport authority of india undertake a development of brownfield airport in which they have selected six states that is ahmedabad jaipur guwahati tiruvananthapuram mangalore lucknow under public private relationship mode in 2019 this project include the development of operation and maintenance of city site creating infrastructure facilities like uh like hotels restaurants retail shop etc this was all about india and in, in, in its initiatives now we will see some other example of other countries which successfully implemented the monetization strategy so the first example is about australia asset recycling initiative before first um before proceeding i would like to explain asset recycling so the asset recycling is considered as an alternative strategy 
where there is a considerable public asset base comprises of mature brown tea or surplus or underutilized asset which is leveraged for raising upfront capital for investment in new asset or for revitalization of existing asset asset recycling is been increasingly recognized as a mean of alleviation budget pressure and delivering new infrastructure and services so the concept of asset recycling has been widely implemented in australia through the asset recycling initiative of federal government so the question arises that why what is the need for the asset recycling in australia so in year 2013 australian federal government decided to start an examination of infrastructure cost and financing in australia which fo which focuses on the way to improve decision making and implementation process the main objective was to facilitate cost reduction in public infrastructure project and recommendation on policy measure which will help to ensure effective delivery of infrastructure services over both the short and the long run the ari provide monetary in incentive for stages to engage in asset recycling to boost infrastructure development so in this figure where the private party actually provide the fund to the state government and the state government provide the asset for for a longer period of time and the fund which state government government collect from the private party they actually invest in a new in uh, for making a new infrastructure so in this way they are using the previous uh, like old infrastructure and the fund will be helping to engage the uh, uh, will help to create the new infrastructure will then increase the revenue of the country so the major take away from ari is are first the conscious of state and federal government over asset sales and lease the second is the time bought scheme for funding the third is the initiative to state government and the fourth commitment to invest in a new infrastructure a similar a similar project was also taken in indonesia that was that was indonesia limited conscious scheme 2020 though this regulation private sector will will be allowed to manage and operate existing infrastructure asset which consist of infrastructure namely transport transport toll rail water resources and water management system telecommunication power plant renewable energy oil and gas so there is a scheme in which you have to be eligible for the in, uh, for lcs to so to qualify as a lcs asset the infrastructure should have been in operation for at least 2 years and the remaining life of the asset must be 10 years lcs asset will be put on the list and announced to public kkpi and to set up the government to accelerate development of priority infrastructure project in indonesia aside from benefiting from the operation of the commercial asset private sector participating in lcs will also take part in financing new infrastructure private sector will be required to pay a premium to compensate the state or the state owned enterprises for granted of the limited concessions this way the government or the state owned enterprises are able to develop funding to develop a new infrastructure as an asset thank you nisha thank you all three of them for rendering a wonderful speech in this topic thank you nisha thank you girita thank you nilesh thank you everyone uh next we move on to the q and a session before that uh i welcome anyone from this audience side to speak uh, anything about this topic i welcome anyone if they are interested like uh, speaking randomly about this topic anyone from first year second year if anyone is willing they can come if not we will move to q uh, and a session so those who have questions uh, can either uh, switch on the mic and ask or sh uh, share the question in the ch uh, chat option hello 
ya ulas yeah uh, after uh, it was a nice uh, uh, presentation what they did i have a doubt that uh, they have only mentioned what are the merits of uh, this national monetization pipeline uh, the critics are always telling there are some demerits uh, what will be that normally um, uh, some people are telling it is <clears throat> there will be some increase in tax there will be some job losses and we know you know the these uh, monetization if they are not successful then uh, i feel uh, again our corporates will take the loan from the bank and they will run away uh, whether uh, all those things will be happening no i think there is no legal uh, framework has been done for all this I- i'm not sure is there anything like that i'm just asked uh, it's all right uh, yeah sure thank you for the question uh so i'd like to uh, answer and you know allay the fears uh of course there there are always going to be some of the drawbacks or some of the concerns raised by people uh the opponents uh the opposition party as well as economists and you know real stakeholders uh, uh there are certainly some of the things that you know we are concerned about but given that it was more like a presentation uh, which which was supposed to be informative so we didn't include the uh you know the the against points but however i can definitely try and say th- there are some points for example there is no dispute resolution mechanism that has been framed or it it is not very clear you know like if just in case for example the revenue dries down like uh, if the company if a private company that has leased out the project you know they have given certain money uh, certain sum of money to the government sector now what if they you know they estimated revenue they are not able to make of course it would be difficult in the long run for them to sustain this so what is the government going to do just in case uh, you know if it does not work out like if it is not profitable for a private firm to lease out a particular project so that is that is indeed a drawback government should come clearer on this aspect uh, the other aspects that you said could be uh, you know could have some issues such as job losses no uh, uh, i do not find a great merit in this statement because uh, government when it has the ownership of the project it rather employs less number of people and when it is with the private sector they in general in, in employ more number of people given that government salaries beat you know for any 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 post uh if there are government servants beat uh, group d group c or group b they are always higher in general for the worker class than private sector so i uh, i don't think that there would be job losses uh, as far as other concerns are concerned such as uh, you know it failing altogether so we i did mention initially that it is a you know it is just a small fraction of an innovative mechanism it is one of the innovative mechanism under the the major plan which is nip national infrastructure pipeline worth 111 lakh crore so so what if it fails say government is not able to uh, collect 2 lakh crore so they estimate which is 6 lakh crore they are only able to collect 4 lakh crores but i'm sure that given the amount which is very large it would have a minimal impact on the government finances i i'm sure they would have other options available it was just that using this mechanism they could they could actually get the money uh, at almost no 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 such cost and it was a win win cause for both the private sector and the government sector given that both of them were participating for their own merit for their own profit or to achieve their own objectives uh, but i i think uh, in the long run uh, it won't be uh, difficult uh, to uh, you know make this program succeed that's my answer i hope that helps may also we haven't dealt in detail due to the constraint of time we haven't dealt in detail upon the various the consideration that the government has taken for example the formation of invits the formation of reeds special bodies will be formed which will act as major stakeholders and they will sell the equity or the stake to smaller investors we haven't due to constraints of time we haven't dealt into all that also the various projects or the various developments that will be taken into consideration will be done specified by the clauses of the various departments if we had more time we would have dealt into all these details Sure, sure. I, I'm not uh, telling you are not dealing with it. No, no. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just giving you an example of something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just specifying yeah, yeah. the clear, clear details. I mean, the Niti Aayog has released two wonderful reports. If you would like to be interested in reading that, I would share with you. They are not. I mean, that is not a long read. 
but it deals in detail of how the project has been planned how it will be implemented and what are the major takeaways and what might be the potential problems that might arise for example like nisha was saying that this has been done across the world in australia in indonesia in singapore in singapore at some time the government had to step back earlier on the private sector was encouraged to invest in trains and develop infrastructure but since that private player was investing poorly it led to malfunction of trains and the government had to step back again and take control so if something happens in india similar steps might be taken but there have been various bodies formed reeds and invits which shall take care of all these problems i hope that answers your query to a bit yes yes it's fine it's fine it's my concern only and uh, job loss what i mean is if government is using this revenue uh, they they are telling uh, they are, they will be using it for new projects if if uh, they are using it for filling up the fiscal deficit then uh, there will not be new job coming up that's what uh, uh, my side what i'm thinking you know the government has that's ensured what. us and this was the dialogue of amitabh kant the chairman of niti ayog he was in a recent interview with rajdeep sardesai as well he said a very wonderful thing that monetizing your assets and then using them to pay back your debts is similar to selling your gold to buy pizza and we will ensure this is not happening the income that will be earned the revenue that will be derived from monetizing brownfield assets will go only into developing further greenfield assets which will further contribute to the total assets that the government has right so this will increase yeah, all in all it. the total jobs yeah i got it okay. so so this is an interview only so that's what i'm telling there should be some um legal framework should be there for the all those things because if after uh, some some one year if exactly, exactly. Country, the government, government has laid down frameworks the yes. government yeah, yeah. has laid down frameworks for the same there was a three prong policy in the last budget announced which included a formation of a institutional level at ministerial level and all these the beat the national uh, pipe monetization pipeline or the national infrastructure pipeline these all act as a dashboard for the ministries for the various ministry they can track the number of assets they have available they can track the number of assets they can monetize they can track the work going on in real time so all in all this is helping to digitize and keep up to date the various assets that all of the ministries have hello all right thank you thank you yeah okay all right Yeah, thank you. Uh, does anyone other have questions? If yes, please come forward. Right? Yeah, Krishna Prakash, I have one question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, hi guys. So it was uh, a very wonderful session. So the doubt which I had felt in this entire session was like uh, there is an another aspect also, right? Like one social aspect. Yes, we are uh, we are saying about this financial aspects or these fiscal aspects. but there is one something called as a social aspect also like if you are uh, monetizing these brownfield projects like uh, railways or roadways then it 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 lastly affects the citizens right we are giving the tax and after all when the private sector take this for the operation they will definitely increase the tolls or definitely increase the fare rates okay so we are again paying the tax on tax so what's the use in that so if uh, if the government has to increase the revenue it can use another mechanism also right like they can increase the corporate taxes uh, this time the government has cut down the corporate taxes so there are many other innovative ways like so uh, why did the government choose this policy uh, rather than increasing the corporate tax rate or increasing uh, the revenues of the government rather uh, monetizing these uh, key assets that's my question right uh, i'd like to answer uh, your query thank you for the question christy uh, so we could look at other options that could be available uh, with the government it is one of the you know the easiest option is to borrow money now we already mentioned in the you know in my slides i i did show that india's tax to gdp ratio is already abysmally low you know when we compare to our competitors such as china uh, or any other country now given that almost everyone in the country each one of us would like to use uh, the amenities public amenities which are you know world class for, for example someone who's traveled on delhi metro would know that it is indeed one of the one of the most world class project that india has ever built you know the, the size of it the sheer size of it and even though it is being operated by private sector there are so many uh, you know uh, 
the 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 vendors, uh, even the drivers, all these are operated by corporations. Uh, the DMRC is more like an administrative body. Uh, however, we could see that it is, uh, you know, considered to be India as one of the best project, uh, you know, one of the most successful project in terms of uh, the fares. Also, it's it's one of the cheapest as well as it is very profitable. You know, like they they did on around four thousand crore rupees uh, annually before COVID hit. So, uh, I don't think that private sector when they come, they are necessarily going to increase the fare because there is always going to be this indirect. Uh, you know, indirect, what do you say, pressure from the government that they don't increase the fare because it, it is going to be difficult for uh, the government politically to allow the private sector to increase the fares or the tolls, right? So I, I'm sure that a government is always, uh, you know, concerned about these things because if the fares or tolls increase, it would cost them politically. So indirect pressure is always there. So the private sector in general, we've seen in majority of the sectors in the country, they 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 try and increase the revenue by being more efficient and more productive than the government sector. Uh, and we could actually see it in almost any of the projects that the private sector majorly has taken. You know, uh, uh, there hasn't been much of a uh, concern in terms of fares being too high. Uh, uh, so I think uh, uh, it will just be fine. I hope that helps or that answers the, uh, the concern or the question to some extent. Nilesh, would you like to add something? No, so just a simple thing that uh, keeping in mind the current COVID scenario when the government spending has increased so much considerably and people, investors are scared of investing into the market, it would be reasonable only to slash corporate taxes instead of further hiking them, as Chrissy rightly said, right. And uh, right now, the market supposedly, as per interviews of both the CEOs and the finance minister herself, Right now, the market is supposedly filled with liquidity and investors, big investors are interested in investing into the country. And India has already monetized some of its assets. For example, the power transmission investment was launched a few months ago and it was fully subscribed in more than uh, in only two or three days. So monetizing the assets is an efficient way of optimally utilizing what you already have. And NMP is only raising 5% of the total to innovative funds. The government has a plan of 111 lakh crores, right, to invest in the four years, out of which 80% will be invested by traditional methods. The rest 20%, out of that only 5% is done via this NMP. The rest 15% will be done by other methods. This is only a small fraction of what is to come. So utilizing what assets that you have and what is mostly lying defunct or underutilized is advisable. Keeping in mind what you said that, yes, we might have this fear that, you know, corporates play for the profits, they might take profits, they might tax the poor, then the government perhaps will have to step in at some time or the other. For example, we can see in China, I mean, this, I mean, this is a totally irrelevant example. This is from my point of view. I'm just sharing my personal opinion. China encouraged startups to grow heavily. In earlier times, it was supposed to copy startups of the West. And right now it has startups which lead the world. All of a sudden, the recent crackdown, what did China do? It began focusing on social welfare, social economics, social engineering. So my, it might be that at some time in the future, the government would have to step in and would have to take steps. But right now, we need money to develop infrastructure for the betterment of the whole society. And doing that by utilizing our own assets would be one of the best things possible, in my opinion. That's it yeah guys okay so uh, that was that uh, i was also thinking about that like okay uh, i am not uh, criticizing this thing but uh, the thing which i had mentioned like if you had mentioned like uh, that thing uh, that power transmission companies or discoms that uh, we have seen that thing earlier like you know uh, when these discoms were privatized in india then what had happened like in urban areas only they had these distribution companies had focused their thing and the peoples in the poor area or the rural areas had been affected on that thing so if uh, i was saying like if it is uh, properly implemented in our country it is good but uh, yes, yes i is... understand that the thing is we haven't mentioned in this presentation now the problem is we haven't mentioned the various vehicles special vehicle purpose vehicles that will be launched for example a neutral body will be set up in which neither the government nor the private companies can interact or affect it much it will have a board of stakeholders and they will act as decision makers and they will take interest and they will have to manage the thing. The dispute resolution will also probably go to them. So this might help in 
attracting the corporate attract uh, attention to all of the areas this might help in a overall development right because everyone being corporate they are profit driven everyone wants to take what is profitable what works and everyone tries to shy away from what's not profitable but special purpose vehicles with an all author all uh, judgment authority might help allay that fear i'm not even sure of that properly but i'll get back to you once i get into detail this is a brief outline that i just had in mind yeah yeah nilesh okay okay fine uh, so i'm done with my question thank you guys thank you thank you so much hello ashirwad do you have something to speak if yes please come because i saw a lot of messages from your side on chat box if you have anything to speak directly if you are interested please come uh yeah so hello everyone uh, i just wanted to add something that uh, i guess nilesh or nisha has mentioned something about the uh, mumbai pune express way which was around 8422 crores uh, which was given on this so actually i just wanted to add because i used to travel on that road uh, very frequently uh, so what happened is uh, there are two roads for mumbai and pune and the express way the tolls uh, the tolls at the express way it is really very high so it's around nearly 500 to 600 uh, for per vehicle per four wheeler so which is very high so i think that that's really a kind of uh, it's a disadvantage for most of the visitors that used to go there so yeah that's just what i wanted to ask but on the other hand yeah this service is really very good the road length it is it Uh, normally says 20 to 25 kilometers uh, for otherwise if we go to another route then so yeah that's the point i wanted to uh, add all right uh, i think i can answer this question ashurwad so um look uh, there is uh, you know when we have microeconomics as one of our subjects right each one of us has studied that and we are going to study it so there is a there is a textbook microeconomics textbook called principles of economics by mankeev and in that very nicely in the very first chapter itself uh, the author mentions there is no free lunch in the world it is one of the basic principles of economics so you could see and you you yourself giving the answer that there are two roads one of it is very efficient you know it it uh, cuts down the time drastically it saves time uh, because it it is shorter and there are of course different uh, advantages when we are paying the money uh, whereas uh, there is this na- normal national highway uh, you know it is not looked after by private sector so it is normally with the ownership of the government and it is not as efficient as the expressway so the the you know the ultimate thing which comes is that we want to uh use uh public amenities uh or public goods that are world class you know whereas we are reluctant to pay uh for it which is against the basic principle of economics uh so in the long run beat beat us beat any other country beat even china if you want to develop you have to invest in building capitals capital you know assets Uh, long term assets in the country be it expressways railways and all of course if government is going to bring in world class infrastructure there would be higher fees that we would need to pay but i am sure that government because it costs them politically if something is too high you know people are not going to vote the government they will vote out the government uh, in in the long run if uh, the fares are too high so government has to take care of it and they do but ultimately the answer is that there is no free lunch in the world uh that's it yes exactly right yeah so i just wanted to add that that normally local people do not use that road they prefer the old route because the toll rates are very high the, the express way is used by only those who do inter district transport or those do or those who, who don't uh, frequently travel more so so yeah, that's it thank you ashwat thank you for the question it was really nice so thank you so much thank you uh, i hope uh, no one else have a question if yes please come forward okay uh, just a simple question yeah. i hope i'm audible uh, hello okay yes yes yeah uh, so first thing first great talk you guys uh, have done a, a really interactive session especially giridhar uh, nisha and nilish 
great job guys a simple question was that uh, asset monetization so the way the government it's something related with what uh, the question that uh, pristi had asked so uh, the one of the ways in which the government would uh, like to procure funds is through brownfield de-risk assets so for those of you who don't understand what brownfield is uh, so it's basically a type of uh, investment where the government actually purchases the existing products or they lease to actually begin a new production activity or something on the similar lines so this strategy is actually being employed by uh, by bringing in more foreign direct investment so given the situation in our country at the present scenario is that we are losing many banks like barclays has left city bank has left uh, then harley davidson has closed down recently ford has stopped so given the timeline of like 2020 to 2025 uh i think that was a timeline if i was i was not wrong like among you uh, like among giridhar uh, nilesh and uh, nisha what would be your stance on all of this because we don't see it uh, coming through any soon so yeah guys your opinions on this okay yeah i think i did answer quite initially when i said in you know when i was presenting that uh the the major investors are not going to be the companies here uh the the investors are going to be the long term pension funds you know the uae for example uh united arab emirates they have a huge amount of money which they have allocated for investing in nif national infrastructure uh, uh pipeline or there are so many other projects as well other avenues where you know for example there is this ratnagiri project called uh it's it's 45 billion dollar refinery project somewhere in maharashtra so all these projects you know they don't normally uh, bring in companies such as ford or banks like barclays and all these banks for example you know uh, for, for example ford answering specifically to for ford they were actually losing out around 2 billion dollar in last 10 years so it's not something that has happened recently uh, exactly just like you know uh, 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 similarly uh, barclays or any of the bank their operations in india were more or less restricted to the uh you know the to the urban people very less number of people and they're going out of the country in in a you know in an economy as large as ours uh, does not matter much of course it creates news and it creates some sort of negative perception in the mind but in the long run if you see the data fdi has been the highest you know it has been a whopping 75 billion dollar around that last year given that covid is there so fdi or for example there are other forms of investments that are coming to the country they are actually functions of many other things such as uh, low interest rates uh, in the in the us or other major economies such as europe so for example because the the interest rates went down in us a lot of money flushed out of uh, us to developing economies such as india or china of course so that is why our fdi was uh, massive last year it wasn't because a government did something tremendously good but it was mainly because uh, people wanted to earn some sort of return so they took away the money in developed countries where interest rates are abysmally low to a developing economy so fdi or any other such investment is not a function of these things you know like uh, it will not create a negative impact that i can assure you it's a long term pension funds canada pension funds uae pension funds there are many such investors where you know their plan their plan to invest is at least 15 years at least 20 years uh, uh, and you know these companies or these pension funds or asset cons- uh, asset companies actually come and invest in such projects i hope that helps yes gir that was fine Yeah. yeah hello. hello am i audible yes yes ah uh, yeah uh, i have a question actually it was uh, nice to hear uh, your ideas on national monetization plan so actually i am a bit confused uh, about uh, national monetization plan so why because uh, actually asset monetization of this the roads railways power and energy these are actually the strategic uh, strategic sectors in governments and so when private parties uh, coming in these sectors they will be the decision makers uh, key decision makers uh, in government side government side so will it be a threat to our 
society uh, like if, uh, if uh, anywhere government needs money uh, especially in covid uh, we have a lot of expenditures and all so why did the government then uh, reduce the corporate tax actually 5 percentage reduction in corporate tax which is a, a great loss in taxation on government side so how how how, how will we can uh, tell these things actually if government needs money then why did the government reduce the corporate tax then monetization uh, of these strategic uh, sectors will be a, there will be a social impact also so uh, how can you how can we explain both uh, yeah i think i'll just try and answer that pretty quickly uh, as far as your question is why the corporate taxes were reduced uh, i have mentioned in the chat box if you see given that ours is a developing country we need to keep corporate taxes low enough to bring in more companies and investment in the country. For example, there are many other developing countries around, such as China, Indonesia, Malaysia, all these economies are there. If their corporate taxes are lower than ours, you know, if their corporate taxes are, say, 22% or 25%, if we keep our corporate taxes at 30%, uh, most of the companies that want to, say, open factories or manufacturing uh, facilities, they will actually move to these countries, Bangladesh, for example. Uh, and they will they won't actually come and invest in the country given that ours is a huge work workforce you know we need to provide employment to majority of the people and unfortunately employment scenario in india has always been little little bad given that uh, ours is a services led uh, gdp growth in the country so services led economy even though the the jobs uh, people who mostly work are in agriculture sector so we need to provide people with blue collar jobs or people with you know relatively better jobs that, than what they are you know earning right now uh, in other sectors uh, other laggard sectors such as agriculture sector so if uh, we allow the corporate taxes to go down as the government has rightly done it will incentivize a lot of other foreign companies to come and invest in india and we, we can actually see that fdi is increasing not just fdi for in finance in a way financial institutional investors which is uh, which are called hot money but also F FDI in greenfield investments. We could see that there are a lot of companies coming and investing in, you know, uh, blue, uh, you know, these factories, and they're opening greenfield projects. So, uh, bringing down the corporate taxes is very important to incentivize companies so that they come and invest in the country and create more jobs. And also answering the social aspect. I think we've already answered that the social aspect. Uh, uh, government is always, uh, you know government is always concerned about it they always do take remedial measures whenever they take any such major policy decision and uh, it is it will not negatively impact social sector as well given that amount of money is very small for example this year only 88000 crore rupees would be raised uh, uh, according to this plan uh, and in next 4 5 years we are going to raise this amount of money so that is not too high uh, i would say that i i already mentioned that government is already paying 6 lakh crore around subsidy to the vulnerable section of the people. So, of course, they are concerned about social sector. That That's my answer. Uh, I hope that helps. Yes. Rahul, are you convinced? Yeah. Uh, actually, I... Uh, yeah, actually, I'm okay, but uh, a bit doubtful about the implementation. Uh, yeah, let's see how the government is going to implement these things. Thank the you. The implementation Yudhra. will be done, as I answered Christie's question, via special purpose vehicles built, special bodies built by the government that shall be neutral. Neither shall the terms of operation be dictated by the government or the public sector whose assets are involved, nor shall they be entirely dictated by the private sector. They shall be neutral decision makers. Also, there have been right justified concerns because Adani apparently holds most of the private ports and control in India. So people had raised genuine concerns of whether we are are we privatizing and leading leasing companies, uh, leasing out assets to special two companies. Are we monopolizing? But the thing is, the special purpose vehicles built have conditions and clauses included that include the call for multiple investors, having multiple investors with different set of interests will ensure that nobody has a monopolistic approach right 
Hello. Hi, Nilesh. Uh, hello, Nilesh. I have a doubt that whether there is a concept of a neutral committee yet. Any any uh, legal framework of uh, well, neutral uh, committee I'll there? Have to, the I'll have to tell. You, I'll have to get you in detail about the rate and the in which this report is. I'll I'll do that at some later time. Maybe I'm extremely sorry. I just have a brief overview of them. Please, please. But because as far as because, I know, uh, after, yes. Because I'll after definitely. Your, can I get back to you? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine because uh, yes. uh, you are repeating that neutral committee because this is uh, this is what we are wishing to do. But yes, I, yes, I don't yes. think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The same question was raised to the CEO yet. of Niti Aayog, and he answered it. Uh, I mean, he said some clauses about that. I'll get back to you after this meeting, perhaps. This is a nice question. I mean, these are genuine concerns, and I'm very happy that people are asking such questions. Unfortunately, yeah, I right. have a brief. Outlook. I'll get back to you in detail on right. this meeting. Right. That's what uh, because we 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 uh, 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 we I personally not believing on uh, those uh, in front of media they used to tell everything. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I understand. I understand. Because before two thousand fourteen they were telling they will reduce the petrol price. Now I'm paying more than hundred rupees. So even we, that has a justifiable explanation. Perhaps Gurgar will answer yeah. it. But uh, it's fine. It's I fine. Think, uh, I was. I have a just doubt whether there is. No worries. No worries. Yeah, okay. It's fine. It's wonderful that you have such questions. I mean, you are inquisitive. You are paying attention. You are concerned about what's going on. Thank you okay. for asking such questions. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Yes, I, I'm. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I have no other one have questions. Okay, if not, uh, let me move to the wind up session that uh, Jidin will summarize. I hand over to Jidin. Uh, Jidin will summarize this things and uh, he will say the word of thanks. I hand over to Jidin. Welcome, Jidin. Uh, thank you, Krishna Prakash. Uh, hope I am audible, right? Yes, yes, you are audible. Oh, thank you. So the topic for discussion for today was the National Monetization Pipeline of India. So we had uh, three speakers for today or uh, today's event. Uh, Nilesh, uh, sorry, Giridhar Gobal, Nilesh Ranjan, and uh, Nisha Ranjan, and uh, from first year. And he, uh, they are uh, they presented the various aspect of the topic and uh, they uh, presented various dimensions of the topic. And uh, the overall idea of or overall point of discussion was. Uh, with a national monetization pipeline at which government are going to give government asset to the public on long term lease and going to generate revenue to build new infrastructure as an asset for the country so this was the overall uh, topic of discussion uh, while coming to the first speaker giridhar uh, he explained uh, the need and importance of the national monetization pipeline and how it came into existence uh and coming to the second uh, speaker nilesh uh, he was deal with explanation of what are the uh, various assets that shall be monetized and the expected amount of revenue generated over the period of the financial year 2022 to 2025 and finally uh the nisha uh, pointed out and explained various uh, similar asset monetization policies carried out across the world and she also gave some valuable examples too regarding australia and indonesia and uh, so this was how the whole discussion took place and uh, on overall it was a great and relevant uh, i mean interactive uh, i mean uh, event uh, thank you uh, for the speakers three speakers uh, and also i'm taking this opportunity to convey the vote of thanks uh, and on behalf of finance club of sums nitc first of all I'm, i like i would like to thank you uh, our respected HOD Shafi sir and uh, faculty coordinator uh, Radharamanan sir for uh, giving the support to conduct the event successfully. And uh, thank you so much for the three speakers of today from first year, Mr. Girida, Nilesh, and uh, Nisha. Uh, your hard work is uh, really, really appreciable. And uh, it's very much uh, evident throughout the presentation and throughout the discussion part. And uh, Thank you for your great effort and uh, initiative and that made the event successful one. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, all these students from first years as well as from the second years. 
who actively joined and participated uh, the session and hope all enjoyed the session uh, hope all go, uh, have got a decent foundation regarding the topic uh, thank you all we will uh, meet uh, in the next session zoom uh, thank you so much from the finance club team thank you so much i have thank a doubt i have a doubt whether uh, nisha ranjan and nilesh ranjan are relatives Brother. not at all <laughs> no no uh, this is a common surname okay. in the north like kumar or singh this is a common surname ah okay 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 yeah. uh, thank you guys for joining thank you so much thank you all this was an amazing session all three of uh, you great and also those who had question like ullas rahul and all in the great session i was thinking that this session had will be moved to another level if we, if this was in offline mode yes sir. but uh, uh, no no way uh, but this was amazing congrats uh, well presented thank you thank you for attending thank you guys uh, you may leave you may leave now thank you so much everyone for having us here thank you so much everyone for listening us yeah thanks a lot again Thank you, Girida. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you.